Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of In Focus, where we will be talking through our top editing tips for an architecture photo. So let's get right to it. Hi, everyone. Welcome to In Focus with Adam Goldberg Photography and Joseph Roybal Photography. I'm Adam. Hey, everybody. I'm Joseph. And Joe, it looks like you are on the road, my friend. I am. I am. I'm in uh, South Dakota here at the Badlands. Nice. Getting some good shots? Trying to. Man, it's been rough. It's been so far a week of... I've been here since last Saturday or Saturday, last Saturday, and for the first time this morning, and it is Wednesday morning, we had clouds. All right. Well, good. Well, hopefully that continues and you continue to get some opportunities for some good shots. That's right. Thanks, man. How are you doing? I am good. I am good. Um, busy week, getting some shoots in, which is always nice. And so I thought that this would be a good time and kind of follow up with the video from last week. Last week, I kind of talked through an architectural shoot. So this week, I thought, well, maybe I can go through some of my top architecture photography editing tips. How does that sound? Cool. All right. So they are, I wrote them down so I don't forget. Um, we are going to talk about using hue and saturation to get those colors to really be accurate and to pop off the screen. So that's number one. The second is we're going to talk about using curves adjustment layers to add a little bit of snap to your photo. Um, just really add some nice contrast to the shot. The third is to make sure that your image is sharp using the high pass filter in Photoshop for a real quick, easy way, again, to just add a little bit of sharpness to your photo before you deliver it to your client. So that's right. three. Number four is using the gradient tool to quickly and easily make some edits to the photo. So thinking you got all sorts of blemishes on a wall, stuff like that, just use the gradient tool to quickly and easily clean up a wall, make it nice and clean. So that's number four. Number five is then using the skew tool in Photoshop to make sure your vertical lines and horizontal lines are perfect. And if we do have time, I am going to hop into a sixth one, which would be using color layers to paint in accurate colors that maybe for whatever reason aren't there in your photo. So those are kind of my top five. If we have time for a sixth one, we'll get to it. So should we just hop right into Photoshop here and do Dude, it? That's awesome. Yeah. I'm super excited. Awesome. Cool. Super excited. Yeah, these are the things that I've been ha wanting you to show me for the longest time, and now I get to uh, piggyback. All right, or cool. Well, the cake. You, you and our audience here are going to get it all at the same time. There we, there we go. All right. <laughs> all right. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. All right, everyone. Here we are in Photoshop, and this is the first image that we're going to be working with. As you can see, it says main lobby. So this is the main lobby for an office space. Nice office space. This is kind of, again, my base image. So you can see over here, I got just one base image and I'll kind of build it up a little bit until we get to the hue saturation. So then you can kind of see what I'm talking through here with, again, that hue saturation. So first thing is I thought this image was actually a little bit bright as my base image. So I just created a new layer mask, made it a little bit darker. I then added in all of my flash pops. I talked about your flash pops a little bit last week. So hopefully this is somewhat familiar for everybody. But again, there's kind of my flash pops. I made a couple little edits. I cleaned some of the photo up here with this layer. And then now we're going to get into the hue saturation. And this is for me really where some of that color cleanup happens. So the first thing we're going to do is, and I'll just keep that there, is to add a hue saturation layer. Go down to the bottom here where it says create new adjustment layer, and you go to hue and saturation. And what'll pop up over here is your toolbar. And you have sliders for each of the individual colors. So it's on master. I never work with master unless I have to. I usually start down at the bottom with my magentas. And again, this is just focusing on the hue and saturation. And in particular, I'm just going to focus on the saturation. So this is going to show us 
really how much of each individual color is in the photo. So you look at this photo and you'd say, oh, there's no magentas in this image. But I'm gonna take this saturation and slide it from zero all the way to 100%. And what Photoshop is gonna do is start to pixelate all over the photo where there is magenta in the image. And obviously, there really shouldn't be any magenta in this photo. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and take that all the way down to zero. So now I know that there's no magentas in this photo. Does that make sense, Joe? That does make sense, yeah, absolutely. Okay. And so I'm gonna just, for the purposes of this, I'm gonna do this for pretty much each individual color. You can combine them and do multiple within one layer, which I'll do here. So I'm gonna create another hue saturation layer, and then I'm gonna to go to my blues, and I'm gonna slide it up. And again, you can see some blue hidden over here. There's some in the upper corner, all through here. And obviously the chair. So the chair is supposed to be blue, right? That was its yeah. original color if we take that back to right around zero. So the chair is supposed to be blue. But because I wanna get rid of all of the other blue, I'm gonna go ahead and take this down to zero. So again, now I've taken all of the blue out of my photo. So yeah. how do I get this chair back blue? Well, I'm gonna take my brush and you do that by clicking B. So now I have my brush tool activated and my opacity 100%. And you can be as careful and specific with this as you want for the purposes of this edit. I'm not gonna get into super, super detail. All I'm gonna do is paint in the blue back that I want. So I have a white layer mask, my brush is set to black, and all I'm gonna do is paint my blue back in where I know it's supposed to be blue. And right. then I think there was a little bit of blue maybe in this photo that I want. So again, so you can see how, I missed like one little spot right here. You can turn your layer on and off. And then I'm gonna do the same thing now in this same layer with my cyans. So again, I can push it up. I can see over here all of this cyan color that I don't want. So I'm gonna push my saturation down to zero. Same with my greens. Let's see where my green is, 100%. Bring it back down to zero. But I know there was some green in these leaves that I wanna make sure I have. And it looked like maybe there was a little bit in this photo over here. So what I've done up to this point is I have taken all of the magentas that I don't want out of the photo, all of the blue out of the photo that I don't want, all of the cyans and all of the greens out of the photo that I don't want, and I used this layer mask over here to paint back in the areas where those colors exist in the photo and where I do want them. Correct. And again, you can be as specific with that as you want, depending on where the color shows up. You might have to use the pen tool and be very, very specific and outline a box around a shape. So that way you're only painting back in the color in a very specific spot. Does that make sense, Joe? It does. It okay. definitely does. Yeah. And then I'll ask you some questions here as I get yeah. some. So for the hue saturation, again, now we're going to go to kind of when you're, I feel like when I'm doing architectural photography, the two colors that show up the most are our yellows and our reds. And so if I bump the saturation of my yellows up, you can see that pretty much the entire photo has yellow in it. Yeah. And this is where a lot of personal taste and preference comes into play. How much yellow do you wanna keep still in the photo? And for each individual image, it might be different. So it's really up to you. Some people like to go down to zero. They want their whites white, they want their blues blue, all of that. I usually go to about minus 75 as a starting point for my yellows. And I actually do the same thing for my reds. So I'm gonna do my reds here. And again, you can see how much red is in the photo. It's pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so then I'm gonna go again to minus 75. And you can see the difference now in the photo. It's almost gone monochromatic. And in fact, what you'll notice here is that some of this green in the plant has disappeared as well. 
Um, we've lost some of the brown on this back wall and in this front panel on the painting in the front and the back. So you do need to be careful that you're not taking away too much color. And you're going to okay. have to, again, be very specific with where you're going to paint it back. Yeah. So I'm actually going to turn these three off. And this was my hue saturation that I did for the final edit. And so you can see this is what we have. And then I'm going to turn this on. This is grouped. So I need to turn them on individually. So there we go. And so I brought some of this color back in the plant, on the back wall, in the front panel, over here and here. So that way you're getting a lot of those nice natural colors, mm -hmm. but you're not taking away so much that you're turning it into a monochromatic image. Gotcha. Um, and then I'm just going to ask you, before you move on, can you go into that hue saturation grouping, the folder there, and yeah. go to um, each one of those? I was just going to ask you just to show... Uh, sure. Yeah. So, so here's the, the three that we just created. Again, I haven't painted in any of the, the yellow or reds just to, to keep this cool. moving, but to group them, all you do is you highlight the first one, hit shift button, hold click, and then you right click and there'll be a group from layers option that pops up and then you can group them together. You can label them whatever you want. Yeah. And then you can turn them on and off. There you very go. easily so you can kind of see how all of your edits then are working together perfect so again uh, i use the hue saturation to really make my colors as accurate as possible in this case the walls are really not supposed to be yellow the ceiling's not supposed to be yellow that's just the way the light is in the office space, the way the light is maybe hitting the floor, the carpet, the carpet again, doesn't really have any yellow in it, it's gray. And so again, I'm gonna to go to the final version that I did. So I took all of the yellow or about 75% of the yellow out and the red out of the wall, out of the ceiling. And so I think what that does is that just really helps make this blue pop, it makes this flower pop, all of those things. So again, this is a great way to quickly get your colors really, really accurate. Again, you're probably gonna have to use the pen tool if you wanna be very specific around spaces, which is what I needed to do on this front panel. But hopefully this gives everyone a little idea of how they can use that hue saturation in Photoshop to get those colors really, really nice and clean. Perfect, yeah, that looks really good. Awesome. So I'm gonna use this same photo now to talk about the curves adjustment layer. So this is, kind of my number two item on the list that I wanted to talk through today. And again, we're gonna go back down here to our create new fill or adjustment layer. And there's one actually called curves. And after you click on it, you're gonna get this panel up here and you can play with this as much as you want to see what clicking and moving this line does to your photo. Mm -hmm. Let's see, take that off. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and delete this layer and create a new one. So you can play with it to see exactly what it does. But again, to be really, really brief and to give my photo a little extra pop, I go from up here where it says preset and then I either choose between a linear contrast and medium contrast. And what this is gonna do is just add some contrast, give my photo some pop, make those shadows stand out, the highlights stand out a little bit more. So we'll click linear contrast and see what that does. So all it did, again, I'll use this little eye button here to turn it on and off. All it did was just kind of give a little bit of snap is really the best way to describe it to the photo. Again, it's pulling those shadows down a little bit. It's putting the highlights up just a touch, just to give that photo a little bit of snap. If you wanted more, again, you could go to your medium contrast. I usually think medium contrast on its own is a little bit too much. So if I do use medium contrast, I'm gonna to go to my opacity here, and I'm usually gonna bring it, start to bring it down a little bit, whether that's 50, 75%, whatever that number is. Um, just for me, it gives it a little bit more natural look. And so again, you can see that's probably a little bit deeper of a contrast than that linear contrast was. Right, that looks good. So that's just giving it again, a little bit of snap, a little bit of pop, all right, so 
now the next thing we're going to talk about is how I usually get close to finishing my photos and that is creating a little bit of sharpness and we're going to do that by using the high pass filter in Photoshop. And so how I'm going to do that is I have all of my layers here and I'm going to click shift command E and that's going to merge or flatten all of my layers into one layer right here. And then I'm actually going to go ahead and click command J to copy it. I'm then going to go up to filter, other, high pass. And with high pass, so basically what high pass is doing here is you get this weird gray screen. And as you move this, you can see the, how it's impacting the photo. And what this is doing is basically picking out the edges and it's just going to sharpen all of those edges. So the higher you go, the more sharpness basically you're giving to your photo. I usually like to keep mine between about five and 15. It's just to here to add just a little bit of sharpness. So we'll go eight. So you can see, we'll click okay. So we have this like weird gray image. And so what you do is you go over under your layers panel where it says normal and you can click overlay, soft light, vivid light, linear light, pin light, you obviously don't want to use hard mix, but it's really in this area is you can kind of pick the one that you think looks the best. For me, it's usually soft light. And the reason that I like soft light is that it's just really adding that sharpness to the edges. It's not doing a whole lot to the rest of the photo. And so I'm going to here again, click the eyedropper so you can see the difference. So this is before, and then this is after. You might not be able to see it on the screen here, but give it a try next time you're in Photoshop and trying to finish up an image and you'll be blown away by how that little bit of high pass, just adding it in, just gives all of your edges just a nice crisp touch to them. So that way, again, when you're going to deliver your client, it's a super, super sharp image. It's just a nice little touch, especially if we're talking, if there's um, like logos and lettering, you really, really notice it around that, just how much more it stands out after you've done the high pass filter versus when you don't do it. And yeah. again, my advice when you're using high pass is don't go too far with it. Keep it simple. Again, I'm usually between about five and 15 at the most. You can see I was just eight here and that's usually about where I am when I deliver my photos. Perfect. That's awesome. And, um, I just thought here just to make a mention so the viewers, you know, watching this, when you did your shift command E, that was merge visible, correct? Mm -hmm. So all the layers that had the eyeball on them were visible with the exception of that group one. And that's why that group one layer didn't get merged into your curves one layer. Is that right? Yep. Cool. Okay. So yeah. So that was the shortcut for merge visible. Yeah. Okay, cool. And, and the thing is you definitely don't want to do that merge visible until you're pretty much done with almost all of your edits because it makes it more difficult to go back and maybe fix something um, yeah. that you've done before. So just really keep in mind that way I'm, I'm doing this again. This is one of the last steps, if not the last step that Correct. I'm doing before I export the image to deliver Correct. it to a client. Cool. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and hop into this next photo. I'm actually just going to close this one. I'm not going to save it. We're done. All right, so here we are. This is an executive boardroom. This is in the same space. And this time here, our item number four, we are talking about the gradient tool. And I'm gonna show you how this works. So we got our base layer. Again, I usually start with a pretty dark base layer when I'm adding flash. This is adding in all of my flash pops. I've done my hue saturation. Again, you can kind of really see the difference of what that does to the photo. We already talked about that. Um, I made some curves adjustment layers here, just very specifically. And then I'm gonna slide that out of the way just for the moment. And that's gonna totally screw up my Photoshop. There we go, a little bit of pinwheel here. All right, I'm gonna be showing you how I use the gradient tool to quickly and easily fix walls, or in this case, the TV. So we're just gonna zoom in just a little bit here. 
So that way we can see, and I'm gonna use the pen tool. You can use the lasso tool, again, be as specific as you want. I'm not gonna be super specific just because we are moving along here. I wanna keep us time. So now I've made my selection of the TV. I'm gonna zoom out so you can see it. I'm gonna press G for the gradient tool. And I have over here, I'll make sure it's selected to black and white. And then over here, I'm gonna select this linear gradient. So what this is gonna do is give us a nice soft transition in one direction. Nice. So I'm gonna start by clicking here at the edge of the TV and dragging actually out past the TV. And so the reason I'm doing that is because this is gonna give us a nice soft layout. And you can see, there we go. So there's yeah. our TV. You can see the light is coming in naturally from the right, so it would make sense that the TV would be a little bit brighter and lighter on that right-hand side. And before yeah. we finish up, we always, 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 you go to filter, noise, add noise. And I would say you probably only wanna add like one to two pixels of noise, so we'll do 1.5 pixels of noise. And that's because this is highlighted, this is just gonna add noise just where we've selected, which is in the TV, because obviously we don't wanna be adding noise to our entire, entire image. Right. So there you go. So that's how you quickly and easily just add and make a gradient to make the TV look really, really good and really, really natural. And you can apply this as well too, so you can see it before and after. You can do the same thing to walls and big spaces where you need to get rid of objects or change the color of something and have a nice gradual transition. And all you're gonna do is just use your eyedropper tool to select the colors that you want and then you could use the gradient tool in the exact same way again if you wanted to quickly and easily like make that transition right there too yeah cool it looks like darth vader's helmet <laughs> i've always wondered how you get it to look so good <laughs> nice so does that make sense in terms of the gradient tool it does it does and totally man and uh yeah i think it looks great and so, you know, because um, I had been wondering how you get the television to look the way it does in, in your images, because it does have a really cool matte futuristic look to it, which is um, incredible or really good for uh, uh, architectural work. Yeah, and, and the thing is you can drag it kind of at, a di at an angle, kind of really however you want to drag it is where that gradient and how it's going to kind of move and, and, and fade out. So it's a really great tool, again, for transitioning from light to dark when you're, again, trying to make the TV look natural, or again, just trying to get rid of a bunch of different objects on a wall. You can kind of create that nice soft gradient, and then don't forget to add just a little bit of noise, because otherwise it's gonna be just completely flat that gives it, again, that little bit of natural feel by adding noise, because on all of our photos, there is a little bit of noise. Just make sure you have just the space that you want selected to add that noise. Yes. Perfect. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about how to make sure our vertical lines are vertical and our horizontal lines are horizontal. This is a really important piece of architectural photography. So what you do is you make sure you have these rulers on the sides and you can do that by going to view and clicking on your rulers. And then all you're gonna do is click and drag, click and drag and you can pull it down as well. Obviously we don't need to in this case because we don't have to worry about any horizontal lines, but vertical lines, we can zoom in. You can see that that's actually pretty close right there to being a nice vertical line. So yeah. that lines up nice, but if it didn't, all you're gonna do is go to edit, transform, skew, and then you can kind of drag your image oh, yeah. a little bit. Move it so around. Kind of follow your follow your little lines there so you can Exactly. See you would just follow your lines if you didn't have one that was the exactly how you wanted it to. And you'll notice it kind of creates a little bit of pixelization. And that's okay because once you have it lined up then how you want, all you do is you click return and Photoshop works its magic and kind of gets rid of all that pixelation. But now you are going to have to potentially worry about maybe doing a little bit of cropping because you might have a layer underneath right. that isn't going to line up perfectly at that point. So that is how I quickly and easily get my 
horizontal lines horizontal and my vertical lines vertical. Just use that skew tool. That's awesome. The rulers. Yeah. So those are my five tips that I wanted to, to make sure we hit on today. How, how, do we, how do we do, Joe? I think pretty good, man. I really do. And I think, you know, like I was talking to you a little bit in a, or before we kicked off, just your flash props here, you know, because I think that, that there's so much info, like uh, useful nuggets in architectural photography uh, and what you do because you're so good at it. We could definitely expand on these in, in future episodes. Yeah, so we didn't get to talk about the color layer, which I know I want to. And yeah, I would happily do a flash pop layer here at some point as well. So just talk through how I go yeah. about that and add them in to, to kind of get an image so that way it looks like this. Yes. Cool, all right. Well, I'm gonna hop out of Photoshop and we can finish this episode up. Cool. All right, so that was my five top tips for editing an architectural photo. We have our hue saturation layers to make sure our colors are super sharp and accurate. We have our curves adjustment layer to give us a little bit of pop. Then we have our high pass to give our sharpness, make that little tweaks. We have our gradient tool. Again, that's great for TVs, walls, other spaces where you need to really clean up a bunch of the image quickly and easily and have a nice soft transition. And then again, the skew tool for making sure that everything is nice and straight. Yeah. So this, this was a good one. I hope that everyone enjoyed it and get something out of it in terms of how I go about editing my architecture photos. Yeah, man. I mean, definitely I, I dig it and I, I'm sure everyone else that's watching this will also, you know, enjoy it. And I've been wondering those things, like I said, um, when it comes to the television and the gradient, and then even making sure the lines are straight. So that's super helpful to see those tips and techniques. Yeah, man. I'm glad, glad that I was able to share them. Yeah. Well, and this happy to do good. more. Happy to do more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's the idea here, right? Give, yeah. Give our fan base all they want. Give the people what they want. Yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. So, all right, with that, we'll close out this episode. Thank you everyone for tuning in. You can find us on YouTube at In Focus Videocast, on iTunes and Spotify and all of your favorite podcast locations at In Focus Videocast. Please do emails with questions, comments, topics that you want to go over, all of those fun things at infocusvideocast at gmail.com. Yeah. Hit us up. Yeah. Let us know. But um, Joe, always a, a pleasure chatting with you here. I enjoy it. And good luck with the rest of your landscape journey in South Dakota. Thanks, man. Yeah. And good luck there too with everything you got going on at home. Awesome. Thanks, man. Yeah. I appreciate it. So thanks everyone for tuning in. That is the most important thing. We appreciate you all. Take care and uh, we will talk to you next week. Thanks. Yeah, you bet. All right. See you. Bye.